Hi everybody, this is an intro to the Quantopian lecture series. So if you're already familiar with Quantopian and with the lecture series, please feel free to skip ahead. Quantopian is a crowdsourced investment firm. And our goal is to democratize quantitative finance and to level Wall Street's playing field by providing a lot of free tools and data of the same caliber that you would run into as a professional on Wall Street. Our business model is to provide capital allocations to the best algorithms that are developed on the platform. To this end, we've developed a pretty extensive educational curriculum to make sure that our users are well educated. The Quantopian lectures are developed in conjunction with and are used for teaching by professors at top universities all around the world. We also work with industry practitioners to make sure that all the examples that we teach are current and up to date with techniques that are actually being practiced in the field today. In general, we try to teach theory and intuition hand in hand so that once you've learned a concept, you have readily accessible code snippets to then go out and apply it. Let's get right into it then and see what we're getting into today. So today we're going to talk about leverage, which is an important thing to consider whenever you're dealing with any sort of trading strategy, let alone an algorithmic trading strategy. The basic idea behind discussing leverage and including leverage in any sort of strategy is that Debt is just another financial instrument that you can include as part of your portfolio. So when you take on leverage, when you take on debt, what you're doing is you're increasing your overall capital base by the amount of the debt. So what ends up happening is you can lever up your returns. You can lever up the, the quantity of money that you're getting for, uh, for, for just the interest payment cost. So the way that we actually go about and get this leverage. The way that we include leverage in a strategy is it depends on the broker that you're dealing with. So whenever you have any sort of portfolio or any sort of strategy, you can set up some stuff with your brokers such that you can trade over the account balance. And that, that ends up being something called trading on margin. And that gives you some extra, a little extra something something in order to uh, trade a higher amount of capital. So a big reason to kind of keep leverage under control whenever you're building and testing a strategy or any sort of portfolio is that, well, when you're trading on leverage, you're trading other people's money. And other people don't really let you trade their money for free. So if you have a highly volatile algorithm or a highly volatile strategy that loses a lot of money, you may end up not being able to pay that broker back or pay back the debt that you owe. So this is why we want to keep this under control in general. This is why it's something that we're concerned about, especially because, well, if you have a good strategy that works with a leverage ratio of 1.0, well, then you can just lever it up if it has a low enough volatility. You don't need to build the strategy such that it has a high amount of leverage in the first place. So the point here is that leverage is when you reinvest debt to gain a greater return on your investment. We just include it in the portfolio as with our equity, as with futures, as with whatever else is in there in order to supplement our capital base so we can buy more securities, engage in more futures contracts, and so on and so forth. So the way that we actually calculate this leverage ratio that I mentioned is debt plus capital base divided by the capital base. So essentially, it's whatever extra stuff you have over your capital base. So let's just show a super basic example of using leverage in the strategy, right? We'll import some basic libraries here. Uh, we'll say that we have a capital base of $100,000 and we get about a 5% return on this portfolio, right? So we would get 5,000 flat returns without any sort of leverage. However, if we included an additional $100,000 worth of debt, then, well, we have a leverage ratio of 1.0, so we're trading with twice the amount of what we're dealing with. Our leverage ratio is 2.0, my mistake. And we get an extra return overall. We've essentially doubled this portfolio return by doubling the capital base with leverage. However, uh, whenever you're borrowing money, it's almost never going to be for free, right? So let's say that we have a very small interest rate associated with this. Let's say that we have to pay 2% back. And this is just in a simple one period model. Essentially what we're doing is we borrow the money at time zero, we invest everything at time zero, and we realize our return and make our payment at time one. So we're not considering any sort of compounding or additional stuff here. So this interest payment is going to be, well, the interest rate on the debt times the value of the debt 
this leveraged return is going to be the capital base plus the debt times the return on the portfolio, right? Since the debt just gets added to our capital base and we're trading all of this money and we get this 5% return on the portfolio here. So that's going to be the total return we get that's leveraged. And then we subtract out this interest payment that we have to pay at time one for a realized value of the, the leverage return minus the interest payment at time one. Then in order to calculate this new return that we get on top of the capital base, we're just going to divide this by the capital base. We'll calculate the leverage ratio as defined up above. And we get that we get 6,500 flat returns and around a 6.5% return with this one and a half times leverage and 2% interest. So even when we have to pay back the money, we're still benefiting ourselves by taking on this debt. So if you have, if you have a sufficiently non-volatile strategy, a sufficiently stable set of returns, then it is a good idea to include leverage. So the more complex uh, version of this sort of model, right, would be where you borrow a, a very large money, a uh, very large amount of money at time one or at time zero at the very beginning of uh, the creation of your strategy, and you pay it back slowly over time. So of course, including more time periods ends up making this more complicated, right? Because your interest is not simply dealt with simply over in one time period. You'll make some set of different interest payments. You're going to have compounding interest, all this other stuff. But this is just a, a very basic, simple teaching example in order to get across this idea that we can use leverage to improve the overall returns of our portfolio, provided that we have this guaranteed return, right? Because in this particular case, we're guaranteeing a return of 0.05. And when we're building a strategy, when we're back testing a strategy, we can't be guaranteed that this return is going to happen going forward. This is why we're so concerned about the volatility of a strategy and any sort of forecasted volatility of a strategy. Just because, well, if you don't have that volatility under control, then your risk adjusted return is going to be significantly less, which means you're going to be significantly less willing to lever that up. So as I briefly mentioned up above, we can get leverage basically through an agreement with our broker. Depending on what sort of account you have with your broker, they may or may not allow you to borrow up to some ratio of the capital that you have in the account. So whenever you run a back test, it's a good thing to include leverage as one of your recorded variables, as something that you're monitoring whenever you're going through. So for example, I'm just going to pull this back test, which is a back test based off of our long short equity lecture template. And if you run that, get your own back test, you can test this yourself or put in any other back test that records leverage, right? So it will pull out the leverage here and we'll look at it over time here. So this is what you'll typically see in an algorithm that has leverage or that is able to take on some amount of leverage or not, right? It's not going to be a consistent thing. You have some capital base and you're going to fluctuate around full capacity of that capital base as you buy and sell things. Occasionally, you'll buy things that forces you into a sort of levered region, right? Where you need to borrow a little bit of money to complete the orders that you're trying to execute, which is happening up here, right? We're getting levered up and we need some extra cash and we oscillate around 1.0. We liquidate a bunch of stuff. We end up paying back our debt. Uh, the leverage ratio drops and sort of oscillates back and forth, right? But this is a relatively stable leverage ratio around 1.0. This is something where if we have a good sharp ratio, or if we have a decent return with low volatility in general, we can just increase this leverage to increase the overall return and gain a better return on this strategy. So one of the big reasons why the leverage may spike here and there is because, well, the size of the orders, right? As we rebalance at the beginning of each month, right, this is going to change how we, how we spend the money that we have, how we borrow more money to augment that money that we have. It's going to change each month as we place different size orders, right? So that's a big thing that affects your leverage ratio. The sheer number of names that you're trading, how much you're trying to trade on them, whether you're rebalancing daily, monthly, or weekly. But you can actually limit this leverage, right? As part of the Optimize API, you can select your weights in such a way that you constrain the maximum gross leverage. I, I believe the, con the constraint is actually called max gross leverage. And you pass in some floating point value of typically 1.0 is what I use whenever I'm testing a strategy or building anything out. Because that guarantees that I, or at least tries to guarantee that I'm going to have 
weights selected for all of the individual names that I'm trying to trade such that my leverage ratio is 1.0 or less. This makes it easier to see a kind of unbiased view of how the returns of my portfolio are, are going, right? How the returns of my algorithm are, are running through time. Because then, well, if I have a good strategy, if I have a high sharp, sharp ratio by itself, low volatility, well, I can just lever it up, get a higher return. So changing the sort of algorithm that you're messing around with could also be another thing that affects your leverage. All these things kind of go into this, right? Like if it's something that's trading only two names or three names, that's going to be different from something that's trading thousands of names. Or I, I, this, uh, this long short equity strategy trades over the Q500, right? So that's up to 500 names on every single day. I think it actually selects positions of about 150, 150 long and 150 short, but that's still a lot of names moving around. That's a lot of shares. And if we look at the actual returns here, we see that, okay, well, these are pretty decent, but there are certain periods where we have higher volatility, right? This might be something that we're not so excited about when it comes to an actual strategy. So our mean return over this whole time period is uh, around zero, essentially. Well, we have this volatility of 0 0.004. We want to be monitoring this mean return and this volatility together. And we do this by calculating the risk-adjusted returns here. This allows us to basically calculate the unit of return per unit of risk for a given strategy or for a given portfolio which allows us to kind of like standardize them and compare across strategies that have different volatilities and different mean returns, which otherwise would be not really comparable. So our main measure of risk-adjusted returns is called the Sharpe Ratio here. So what we do is we take the return of our portfolio, we subtract out the risk-free rate, and we divide this by uh, sigma p, which is the volatility of our portfolio. So this gives us what we're looking for specifically. Generally, when we lever up any sort of portfolio, we, the, the leverage that we're taking on, that debt that we're borrowing, we borrow at the risk-free rate, this rate here. So the end result here is that as we lever up a strategy, the Sharpe ratio remains the same because while well, our return multiplies by the amount of leverage and so does the amount of payment that we have to make for that leverage. So we have, if we're levering up n times, then we have n extra return and have to pay n more of the risk-free rate and we get n more volatility on top of that. So the Sharpe ratio just stays the same. We just get an overall greater absolute return for the same unit of risk. So a very quick example of this, right? So let's say we have uh, strategy A, some annual return, and it has a volatility. Similarly, B has an annual return and it has a volatility. Now, if we were just looking at returns, right, strategy A has a significantly higher return than strategy B here. It's about four times as much. So naturally, without seeing this risk, right, or if these had the same amount of volatility associated with them, then, well, we would obviously invest in strategy A just due to the greater return in the first place. But having these volatilities together allows us to calculate these sharp ratios here. So we'll say the risk-free rate is 0.02, um, and we'll calculate the sharp ratio of A, so just return minus the risk-free rate divided by the volatility, and B, uh, the sharp ratio of B is just the return minus the risk-free rate divided by the volatility. Similarly, we'll calculate the Sharpe ratio once we've levered everything up for B, which should stay the same, as well as the levered annual return as a result. So this gives us that A before levering, uh, well, B before levering has a Sharpe ratio of 1.5, A has a Sharpe ratio of 1.3. So we know that with B, we're getting a better deal than with A, just because, well, our per unit of risk return is better than with A. So we'd prefer to invest in strategy B in this case. After adding in this leverage, multiplying everything by three in B, we see that the Sharpe ratio is still 1.5. So we still have this linear return, but this overall annual return is greater than if we had just had B by itself without any additional leverage. And this stuff is just all important to keep in mind whenever we're considering any set of portfolios or comparing between any set of portfolios. We can always lever up the return, and what we want to be doing is comparing between the Sharpe ratios to decide which return stream we want in the first place, which return stream we want to lever up. Because 
this sharp ratio or any other measure of risk adjusted return is going to tell us which is giving us a better deal, which strategy is the highest value for us. Thank you for watching the Quantopian lecture series. If you have a desire to see any more of our content, it is all available at www.quantopian.com lectures. If you're already on the Quantopian site, you can also get to this page by going over to Learn and Support, clicking on Learn, and then this lectures link will bring you right back here. All of these lectures have a notebook associated with them, which contains the theory and applications for the lecture. It's the real meat. Many of these lectures will also have a video associated with them that you can watch, just like the one that you just watched. And then some of these lectures are going to have algorithms that you can clone and iterate on just to give you a basis to start with your own algorithmic trading ideas. We also have a GitHub, which is at github.com slash quantopian slash research underscore public. All the stuff that's on our lectures page is also here if you dig around. You can also follow me on Twitter at clean underscore utensils. And we also have, last but not least, uh, some resources available for any sort of academics who want to incorporate the lecture series into their classes. All of this stuff is free. We just like to provide a little bit more guidance for professors who want to get Quantopian involved with how they teach. Lastly, you can email me at max at quantopian.com, and that's just M-A-X at quantopian.com. Feel free to send me any sort of feedback, any sort of questions you have about the lecture series. We're always looking to improve things, so we always want to hear comments about how we can make it better. Thank you so much.